The Jackson Center is honored to have uh, one of America's most distinguished historians, uh, Professor James T. Patterson. Professor Patterson recently retired uh, after 30 years of teaching U.S. history at Brown University, where he was the Ford Foundation uh, Professor of History. Uh, he began his career at Brown after graduating from Williams College and getting his master's degree as well as his Ph.D. from Harvard University. Uh, he's the author of many books throughout his career, uh, and in 1997, he was the winner of the Bancroft Prize uh, for his synthesis of post-World War II U.S. history, Great Expectations of the United States, 1945 to 1974. For those of you who aren't historians, the Bancroft Prize is kind of like the Pulitzer Prize, except better. Uh, it's uh, among the most distinguished awards that can be bestowed upon a historian, and the Jackson Center is thrilled and, and honored uh, to have uh, such a distinguished scholar here with us today. In Professor Patterson's uh, latest book, he takes us on a journey that not only sets the stage for Brown versus Board of Education, but also evaluates the impact of that case, not just on education, not just on race relations, but on the Supreme Court uh, itself. Important cases aren't simple, and Brown versus Board of Education is certainly one of the great Supreme Court cases of all time. While it may seem in hindsight that the proposition that a state may not discriminate against its citizens on the basis of race uh, may seem to be self-evident, uh, at the time it was an extremely controversial proposition. And even once a majority of Americans had uh, decided to come on board with that idea, there was still a lot of controversy over how, wh what that idea really meant. Uh, and it, it was obvious that simply striking the segregation laws, the Jim Crow laws, off the books when it came to education wasn't going to do much uh, to change the day-to-day -day life of African Americans, particularly in the South. Dr. Patterson's book considers many of the difficulties that uh, this country encountered in trying to bring Brown versus Board of Education uh, to life. Uh, he addresses some of the revisionist historians and, and uh, civil rights workers who have maintained that Brown versus uh, Board of Education actually might have hindered uh, rather than helped the civil rights movement. And for me, this is, is the strongest part uh, and most meaningful part of Dr. Patterson's book. He does acknowledge that there were disappointments and, uh, and defeats along the way, but he does ultimately insist and, and, and demonstrate that Brown versus Board of Education was a milestone and was a landmark uh, in the advancement of race relations in this country. He also looks beyond the issues uh, uh, that were endemic to the case itself and argues that the court itself was transformed by this decision. Uh, and the fact that it has gone on to issue decisions of importance to women, to the disabled, to gays and lesbians, and other disadvantaged groups uh, is proof that the court had been forever transformed uh, by its participation in Brown versus Board of Education. I'm thrilled that the Jackson Center has been able to bring such a distinguished scholar here. Uh, please join me in welcoming to the Robert H. Jackson Center, Professor James T. Patterson. Jackson Center have done to make this um, such an outstanding, although new, uh, building and uh, museum and, and uh, a way of honoring, <coughs> honoring the uh, very important role that, that Robert Jackson played in our history as well as in this decision. My introduction said a good deal about some of the things I'm going to say today but I will uh, try to keep my talk down to a couple of hours. <laughs> Be out of here by uh, three or so. I'm actually going to plunge right in. When Ralph Ellison, the black writer, heard about Brown versus Board of Education in May 1954, he wrote a friend, what a wonderful world of possibilities for the children. He was not unusual, not alone in expecting wonderful things from the decision. Harlem's Amsterdam News editorialized, the Supreme Court decision is the greatest victory for the Negro people since the Emancipation Proclamation. 
Thurgood Marshall, who was chief litigator for black defendants in the case, <clears throat> recalled, I was so happy, I was numb. He and others celebrated far into the night. At the time, Thurgood Marshall estimated that state-supported school segregation would be wiped out nationwide within five years. He also uh, guessed, by the way, that segregation generally, not in schools, would be history by the time of the uh, 1963 or 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. And I was so taken with Ellison's comment about the wonderful world of possibilities for the children that I wanted to use his quote either as a title or a subtitle uh, for my book on the subject. Uh, but my publisher, typical of publishers, demanded a title that would tell people what was in the book. So it has a wonderfully catchy and imaginative title, <laughs> Brown versus Board of Education. <laughs> the subtitle, subtitle however, uh, does give, I think, a reasonably good sense of the ambivalence that I came to feel after uh, researching and writing this book, which was published in 2001. The subtitle is A Civil Rights Milestone and Its Troubled Legacy. And I'll be talking about both of these um, today. I want to reflect um, upon the case uh, and to ask um, to what extent we may say, nearly 50 years later, that the high hopes of Ellison, Thurgood Marshall, black editorialists, and many others have been realized. Now, my book and other scholars who have written about this, and by the way, there have been several uh, books that have appeared since mine, and there's any number of, of uh, conferences and uh, speeches on the Brown case that are taking place this spring. And there's all kinds of legacies that one can look at in studying the case. And I want to look at two, or if I have time, three. First, how great an impact did the decision have on advancing the powerful civil rights movement that mushroomed in the early 60s? This was alluded to in the introduction. Second, has the Brown decision and desegregation of schools made a significant difference in the academic and lifetime achievement of black people? If I, have, if I have time, as I hope I will, I'll also say a little more about what I think the Brown case may have done for race relations generally. But I'm going to start by asking, what effect did it have on the civil rights movement? Now, when the civil rights movement gained force in the 60s, the answer to this question uh, seemed to be very obvious. And this was the slant that most early students of the civil rights movement took. And that is that the impact of the Brown case on the movement was huge. And you can read, and those of you who are history teachers, and I'm pleased to be talking to many of you today, as well as to people from the Rotary and others, um, the um, books that students used to read on the Civil Rights Movement written in the 60s and the 70s would ordinarily accord the Brown case a uh, very great role in the development of the Civil Rights Movement in the 60s, which in turn produced those very important pieces of legislation, the two most important pieces of legislation in modern American history, Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which uh, really did do away with many of the vestiges of, not just vestiges, but many of the uh, current practices of, of segregation uh, in 1964-65, but not in 1954. But it seemed to these early people that Brown was the first event in a chain of causation, leading to the great acceleration of the civil rights movement in the 60s. And one and a half years, for instance, after Brown came the memorable boycott of buses in Montgomery, Alabama. <clears throat> Two years later, in 1957, President Eisenhower had to send in federal troops to maintain token desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock. This, of course, would not have happened without Brown. And then in the 60s, as, as I've said, the movement, civil rights movement swelled, ultimately, ultimately forcing Congress to pass the laws that I mentioned. There's other events also in this chain that seem to link directly to the Brown decision and also indicate its ongoing symbolic importance and the importance of May 17th, which was the date upon which the decision was uh, read in 1954, so-called Black Monday, to uh, many of the Southern opponents of the decision. Martin Luther King, for instance, staged a prayer pilgrimage 
to Washington in 1957, <clears throat> the third anniversary of Brown. The first group of 1961 Freedom Riders, organized by CORE, the Congress on Racial Equality, also announced that they intended to reach their final destination. They were trying to desegregate waiting rooms on interstate travel, and they were beaten up and never reached their destination, but their goal was to reach New Orleans, the end of the trip they started from the East Coast on May 17, 1961. But in hindsight, I think we can be justified, and many revisionist scholars, people revising the historical record, if we didn't do that, we wouldn't have work as historians, <laughs> uh, how vital the Brown decision was as a stimulant to the civil rights activism that really took off only in the 60s. In the first place, the decision, while supported at the time by a small majority, maybe 55 or 60 percent of northern whites, and very, very small percentage of southern whites, this decision did not transform these northern whites into forceful champions of desegregation. You find a lot of polls out there in which the northern whites will say 55, 60 percent, yes, it was a good decision. Then they're asked a question, what should the government do to enforce it? And the answer is the very, very low percentages. It wasn't the government's role to enforce this. The decision had, made, had been made, let the South obey it. Well, of course, uh, this meant, as you know, and as I'll point out, the decision was flaunted and not obeyed. <coughs> Uh, so, while well, you have a small, small minority of Northern whites uh, supporting it, they weren't pushing for desegregation. Until the 1960s, when militant civil rights activism and television dramatically altered Northern opinion, uh, most Americans, including liberals like Eleanor Roosevelt, and I'm not singling her out, Adlai Stevenson and others, uh, counseled for incremental cautious change. The Democrats, including President Kennedy when he became president, we're not anxious to offend the white South and lose those valuable electoral votes, since the South in those days was overwhelmingly Democratic. Uh, the Republicans uh, under Eisenhower were not pushing uh, to enforce the law. Uh, Eisenhower sent the troops to Little Rock, but because that was because there had been a direct challenge to his authority, uh, not because he supported the decision. He never said it was a good decision. Uh, he never said that uh, segregation was immoral. Uh, and uh, so. There was no serious pressure at all on the part of either party to uh, make the Brown case into something or to promote uh, other uh, civil rights uh, goals on a large scale. Legal, uh, leaders of the legal profession were also cautious. In the summer of 1957, 38 of 46 state chief justices declared that the Supreme Court ought to exercise more restraint than it had shown in its Brown versus Board of Education decision. I think it's also fair to say that the Brown decision did not inspire a great many black people to take to the streets in the 1950s. In fact, we as historians now look back on the late 50s and are struck by how relatively little direct action, grassroots, acting with your feet kind of protests or demonstrations were taking place in the late 50s. Montgomery, of course, was a large and uh, amazing exception. But civil rights activism was relatively quiescent in the late 50s. In 1955, 57, and 59, there were, in fact, fewer civil rights demonstrations in the United States than there had been in 1943, 1946, 1947, 1948. The immediate post-World War II period, in fact, uh, was somewhat activist, in part because of the return of black uh, World War II veterans who had fought a war to save democracy and to overturn racism and came home to find it in their own country. Now, I don't want to make the foolish claim that Brown made no difference to the civil rights movement or to the desegregation of schools. On the contrary, can tick off a number of things that uh, it has some effect on. For instance, uh, some mostly white areas of the border states uh, did move to desegregate their schools in the late 50s. I should point out, by the way, that there were, of course, 11 Confederate states, what we think of as the South, Civil War Confederate states. There were 10 others, however, which also segregated in various ways, usually as a result of local option. One of these uh, states, of course, was Kansas, the Brown versus Board of Education case 
is the Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. It was one of five cases decided um, by the court on May 17, 1954. Uh, one of the others was Delaware, a border state also. The other three were D.C., Virginia, and South Carolina. There were a whole lot, a whole lot of litigation all consolidated into this one case. Um, so some of the border states did come across. Furthermore, the court in the late 50s used Brown as its constitutional basis, its precedent, for decisions at that time that struck down segregation in some other public facilities, municipal golf courses, beaches, parks, and of course the buses in Montgomery. It's not all, always known, but what brought an end to that year-long boycott was a favorable Supreme Court decision. And Brown was the basis for its judgment that blacks did not have to be segregated on the buses. More generally, Brown encouraged the Warren Court to advance the rise of so-called public interest litigation. And those of you who are lawyers will know how huge this has become in our legal system compared to what, what it used to be. And we can finally agree that the Brown decision, uh, as my mention of the May 17th date is suggested, uh, had considerable symbolic value to African Americans. After all, the law was at last on their side. I might add, by the way, the symbolism never seems to end when the Supreme Court was deliberating, deliberating on the um, Michigan Affirmative Action cases in the spring of 2003. Uh, you could you look back in your newspapers and you can find uh, students uh, milling about the building and, and uh, supporting affirmative action don't let Brown versus Board of Education die. And then more recently, the Supreme Court of the state of Massachusetts, by a four to three vote, has declared that in Massachusetts, uh, gay marriage will be all right as of May 17th, 2004. And I'm sure that, that choice of date was not accidental. Having said all that, I mean, the decision wasn't a waste of time or breath by any means. But having said all that, um, it's hard to know how important the case really was insofar as advancing the civil rights movement, which is what I'm talking about. If we look at the next 15 years, between 1954 and 1968 or 69, the Supreme Court is mostly silent, with exception <coughs> of one case in 64, until 1968, on how or in what ways this um, uh, this decision should be enforced. You'll recall that they waited a whole year till May of 1955 before issuing so-called Brown Roman numeral two. Brown two had the famous phrase in it, uh, it was supposed to decide when and how uh, this decision would be enforced. It said that the southern schools should uh, do this with all deliberate speed. Well, deliberate means with deliberation, the speed means quickly. It was a mysterious phrase. Uh, it had no effect at all. And as of 1964, 10 years after the decision, 99% of black public school children in the South still went to entirely segregated schools. In short, for 10 years, the decision, it had no effect in the South. And I should add, you, know, you probably already know this, it had no, no effect anywhere else because it was aimed only at those states 11 southern states plus the 10 others that partly did it, which mandated by law segregation. De facto segregation, which exists everywhere in the country then and now, was not uh, in any way affected by this decision. So for 10 years until 1964, almost no change in the South, and indeed by 1968, still very little. It's not until after that that the court begins to making new decisions and the Civil Rights Acts come into effect uh, and the federal bureaucracy, equal, e equal Employment Opportunity Commission, various other things, the rise of affirmative action, all these things are products of the very late 60s and 70s, uh, but not of the period 1954 until then. And this has led a lot of people to criticize the court for what they allege is the timidity of Earl Warren, Chief Justice Earl Warren, and his colleagues. And the criticisms uh, run again as follows. Warren and the fellow justices, it was a unanimous decision. Uh, the critics point out, I'm not talking about Southern critics now, I'm talking about liberals who wish the decision had done more. 
they, they say in retrospect that the court should have said something about racism in, generally, in general. It should have denounced de facto segregation. Uh, it should have uh, said something about segregation, including a whole range of state laws, segregated public accommodations, segregated employment, uh, and banned uh, marriage between blacks and whites. They, they say that the court should have said something about this. Uh, they said that Brown too, of course, was a disaster. This, uh, this all deliberate speed uh, uh, said nothing and gave no guidance to the courts and also required subsequent uh, plaintiffs, subsequent black families and others who wanted to complain about segregation. The burden of proof was on them. They had to find lawyers, they had to pay for lawyers. They had to undergo the slow and uh, painful process of litigation. Um, so all of these things have been, uh, all of these criticisms have been fired at the court over the years. My view of these criticisms is, is that they are ahistorical. This is something I always made a big thing of in my teaching of history. If history is good for anything, of course I've done it all my life so I think it is, uh, it's to help us understand how the past was, not how you would like it to be. Uh, so that you can put yourself back into the position of living as an adult American in 1954 and if you did that, and uh, some of you may be almost old enough to, 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 to have remembered that, um, you understand that the Jim Crow system of uh, mandated segregation was a very, very harsh and unforgiving system uh, which differed from apartheid only in small ways. Uh, and so for the Supreme Court to have struck down school segregation, and schools were and are the most sensitive areas of race relations, um, to have struck down school segregation in 1954, this was a bold, it was a radical, it was an historic step, it was a civil rights milestone that all elected officials had refused and not dared for political or other reasons to take. And one of the many interesting aspects, of course, of this is living in a democracy, the world's oldest democracy or old, oldest Republican form of government. Uh, to strike down race relations, it required decisions of appointed lifetime judges, the most undemocratic of our branches of government, to get something done. There's a lesson there. Um, at any rate, those who question the dominating impact of Brown also remind us, and I do this in my book, that to single out Brown as the way the civil rights movement started, um, is to oversimplify the process of multiple causation. And there were a lot of other things out there uh, that preceded Brown and that in fact led up to Brown and influenced Brown that um, helped help us understand why the decision was made. They were massive in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, south to north and rural to urban migrations so that you had significant uh, voting blocks of blacks in the northern states where they could vote that politicians had to pay attention to. Also, the blacks were assembling in cities in the South and in the North, thus making mobilization of a civil rights movement in terms of organizing it much simpler than it had been in the old days when the vast majority of blacks were scattered in the rural South. As late as 1940, for instance, the census said that 77% of African Americans in this country lived in the South. By 1970, it was around 50%. This is a huge demographic change, and it's very important in understanding the civil rights movement. There were also rising economic and educational levels. There's a general consensus then and now that the more education you have, uh, the more <laughs> cosmopolitan you are, the more understanding you are, the more tolerant you are. Uh, I sometimes wonder about that, but I haven't seen some of my students, but still, uh, <laughs> rising education levels presumably uh, promote a certain greater degree of understanding and of tolerance and education levels were rising enormously. Um, there were also struggles against colonialism in black Africa, which were heartening to blacks. There was the civil right, there was the Cold War. How could the United States claim to be the leader of the free world if it treated part of its population the way it treated Negroes in the South uh, before 1954? 
Now, the thrust of some of these courses, notably the Cold War, influenced some of the judges on the court. And these influences became stronger as time went on. And all of them, uh, together, were probably as important as Brown itself in helping generate the many feelings that uh, prompted the rise of the Civil Rights Movement. I've got a qu couple of quotes here. One is from Philip Elman, a liberal Department of Justice official, who later observed, in the Brown case, nothing the lawyers said made a difference. Thurgood Marshall could have stood up and recited, Mary had a little lamb, and the result would have been exactly the same. Jack Greenberg, a top associate of Thurgood Marshall, offered a similar judgment years later, a good book he wrote on the subject. There was a current of history, he said, and the court became part of it. Now, I should say uh, here, that my reservations, which I've just spelled out to you, concerning the uniquely powerful impact of the Brown case on the Civil Rights Movement, these reservations, these complications that I discovered in doing my research, I hadn't really expected when I started, <coughs> because I had assumed that this was uh, a major, uh, that the Brown case was, you know, head and shoulders the most important source of change. And in fact, uh, when I signed the contract for my book in 1996, uh, it became the first book to be published in a series of books, a lot of other ones since then, which has the collective title, Pivotal Moments in American History. Um, I still think the case was very, very important, but whether it was pivotal, I've tried to suggest is difficult to say when you think of the many causes out there that made the civil rights movement possible. And so I now say, and I'll say it again later, that the case was, uh, as I've said before, bold, radical, historic. It was necessary to the civil rights movement. It was not sufficient. What you needed was a large movement, and the <coughs> case did not, certainly not immediately, do that. <coughs> now my second question. What effect has Brown had on the academic and life chances of American black people? Well, in 1954, Thurgood Marshall and uh, most other foes of segregation in this country, as they were preparing this case, didn't think terribly deeply about that question. It was self-evident to them that school segregation meant ill-supported education for blacks. Inevitably, Marshall and the others thought desegregation would result in better schooling for black people. But there already existed a few voices that had expressed doubts about large, maybe utopian hopes, such as Marshall's and Ellison's, concerning the educational benefits of putting blacks and whites in the same schools or the same classrooms. In 1935, America's most prominent intellectual black intellectual, W.E.B. Du Bois, had articulated these doubts in a controversial essay. Du Bois wrote, a Negro school where children are treated like human beings, trained by teachers of their own race, who know what it means to be black, is infinitely better than making our boys and girls doormats to be spit and trampled upon and lied to by ignorant social climbers, these would be white teachers in desegregated schools, whose sole claim to superiority is to kick, this is his quote, niggers, when they are down. This is interesting because, you know, Du Bois was uh, one of the founders of the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, which was founded in 1909. The NAACP then, and all, all the way through its history, it's almost 100 years old now, uh, has been an integrationist organization. But by 1935, Du Bois was becoming very <coughs> discouraged uh, about race relations. And he wasn't so sure that integrated schools were necessarily better for the educational experiences of black children than uh, non-integrated schools. I don't want to misinterpret him. He's not here a black nationalist. He's not opposed to integrated schools. 
But as you can see, he definitely has doubts. Now, since the 1960s, many other African Americans have echoed doubts such as Du Bois's. Uh, one of America's leading left of center law, uh, black uh, law professors, Derek Bell, wrote in 1994, the insistence on integrating every public school that is black perpetuates the racially demeaning and unproven assumption that blacks must have a majority white presence in order to either teach or learn effectively. Bell subsequently, by the way, has written some essays in which he comes very close to saying that the old guideline that Brown struck down, the Supreme Court decision in 1896 of Plessy v. Ferguson, which dealt with railroad cars but was extended to schools, um, and which said that segregation was all right so long as the facilities for blacks and whites were equal, this was the notion of separate but equal, uh, which Brown overturned and said that segregation could never be equal, uh, separate could never be equal. Um, Bell comes fairly close to saying if you really could manage to make black schools equal, maybe separate's better than integration. Here's, the, here's a quote from Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. I don't think he would say that his uh, political persuasion is left of center. <laughs> in the case of Missouri versus Jenkins in 1995, which was a desegregation of schools case in Kansas City, Thomas strongly rejected the central psychological theory underlying Brown. You probably know it. That's the theory based upon the famous experiments with black and white dolls that were shown to black kids, and the kids were asked, which dolls do you like better? The black dolls, they're called colored dolls, or white dolls, and uh, high percentages of the black children chose colored dolls, and the conclusion from these experiments was that blacks had been so humiliated and felt so badly about their color that they actually preferred to play with white dolls instead of black dolls, and furthermore, segregation of schools had promoted this kind of uh, humiliation within the psyches of black people, and therefore, desegregation and integration was necessary. Thomas says that's garbage. He says the theory that black students suffer an unspecified psychological harm from segregation that retards their mental and educational development not only relies upon questionable social science research rather than a constitutional principle, but it also rests on an assumption of black inferiority. So what you're getting here is a convergence of views on the left from people like Derrick Bell, on the right from people like Clarence Thomas, uh, cut across the ideological spectrum. And what many of these uh, feelings reflect is profound discouragement about the so-called white-black test score gap. Uh, the scores of blacks on key academic achievement aptitude tests had in fact increased slowly in the early 70s when desegregation at last advanced in the South while white scores remain flat. And so the gap narrows, and the gap narrows a little bit more in the 80s. But it has since widened, since the late 80s. And the reading scores of 17-year-old black public school students, high school seniors, for instance, is around, is around four grade levels below those of white 17-year-olds. So what's the effect of this? Well, you can imagine what the effect has been on parents. It has accelerated the phenomenon we know of as white flight of blacks out of uh, black neighborhoods in the cities to white suburbs. It also has caused bright flight, as it's called, of uh, some uh, African-American parents uh, who don't want their black kids in these inner city schools. Thurgood Marshall sent his young children in the early 60s to mostly white private schools in New York City. When he was criticized by integrationists, he replied, I think my children should have the best education they can afford, that I can afford. Uh, so, uh, first of all, it took a long, long time for, for desegregation to be operative in the South. Second of all, where and when it's happened, uh, there does not seem to have been uh, any great effect upon improving these gaps. Now, for, for all these reasons, I would argue, uh, the research into the sources of these gaps and action to narrow them, but I'm not sure what that would be, are imperative if racial desegregation of the schools is to move ahead in the future. The sociologist 
sociologist Christopher Jenks, who's written a book on these gaps, has concluded that fighting the gaps would, quote, would do more to move America toward racial equality than any politically possible alternative. You know, if you go home and you try to imagine that you're running this country and how do you improve this uh, race relations in this country, Jenks is one of a number of people who think the answer has to be in the schools and that something has to be done about these gaps. <clears throat> Here's another scholarly assessment by a couple of educational researchers who, who remind people of another famous statement by Du Bois in 1903. You all know it. Du Bois said the problem of the 20th century, which was just starting, is the problem of the color line. These educational writers that I'm quoting said in 2002, the problem of the 21st century might be the color line in academic achievement. Well, I think I do have a little time for moving into a third and final question. What about the larger effect of Brown on race relations in America? Well, to stress the obvious first, non-segregated schools in the United States, let alone integrated schools, and they're not the same thing, have always been hard to find since Brown. I'll give you some numbers in a minute. And Thus, it's hard to prove that the Brown decision has contributed greatly to the promotion of race relations generally, which Marshall and others at the time thought would happen if you brought children of different races together in the school room. There just hasn't been enough of that bringing together for that to be adequately tested. For instance, um, I mentioned that, that opposition to segregation was total in the South until the late 60s. When uh, this, is, this resistance is finally broken and people do start mixing in the schools, um, in the North you have a process of increasing de facto segregation of schools uh, and uh, leading to places like Detroit and Newark and Oakland and Chicago, Washington DC, many other cities which are 70, 80, and in Detroit's case 96% public school children in Detroit are African American. So you don't have even a chance there of, um, of any kind of racial desegregation because uh, school districts, of course, <coughs> uh, represent uh, urban boundaries, and you could ask me about that later, and uh, so it's simply impossible to have segregation in these places, a desegregation in these places. In the last 10 to 15 years, there's been a process of resegregation taking there's something known as the Harvard Civil Rights Project. It's got a website, by the way, if you want to look at it. Harvard University Civil Rights Project. And they bring out numbers from time to time. And their most recent one is show that the percentage of black students today, public school students, who attend majority white schools, that is schools in which the student population is 50% or more white. In the South, the percentage of the black students who attend such schools in the South has declined from a peak of 43% of such black students in 1988, still not 50%, to around 30% in 2003. This percentage of 30% is about the same percentage that existed, that is, of black students in majority white schools in the South in the early 70s, when the process of desegregating finally began. And thus you get a lot of despair Here's the comment of Linda Brown Thompson. She was the little girl um, who had to walk and take a bus uh, to an all-black school in Topeka, Kansas, whereas uh, if there had not been segregation, she presumably would have been able to go to her neighborhood school just a couple of blocks away. Uh, Linda Brown Thompson reflecting in 1994, 40 years after the case, <clears throat> she said, sometimes I wonder if we really did the children and the nation a favor by taking this case to the Supreme Court. I knew it was the right thing for my father and mother to do then. But after nearly 40 years, we find the court's ruling unfulfilled. Here's a comment of Elizabeth Eckford. You all know who she was? She was one of the Little Rock Nine black students who integrated Central High in 1957. 
Forty years later, in 1997, she too had doubts. She said, there was a time when I thought integration was one of the most desired things. She added, 1997, I appreciate blackness more than I did then. So you can find, and I've collected quite a few of these, a lot of uh, discouraged, um, even regretful comments by students who were trying to integrate, black students who were trying to integrate or desegregate these schools uh, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And some of them, as I say, uh, go even further than Linda Brown Thompson and really argue, as Derek Bell comes close to doing, for uh, a system of separate but equal, but truly equal, in which black parents and black teachers who understand the needs of their students uh, will be able to educate their children. But there's another side. The other eight black students of the Little Rock Nine proclaimed themselves glad in retrospect they challenged segregation. By the way, they had a hell of a time. <coughs> Police were there, the whole, I mean, the Army was there the whole year. The next year, Governor Fava shut the school down. Got away with it, too. They were glad they challenged integration. They all went on to college and universities. Other black adults, too, have looked back positively on their experience in non-segregated schools, insisting that these experiences were beneficial in many ways. I've had any number of people say, and I've read, read too, that before uh, they had a chance to go to school with whites. Many of them actually really did wonder if it was true what they said about black people, that they were stupider than white kids. They had no way of knowing whether that was true or not, but it was said so often that they said that some of them came to believe that it might be true. Once they went to school with white kids, they realized that some white kids were smarter, some weren't as smart, some were about the same. Some were nicer, some were not nice. Uh, that is to say, the mystery was gone. Furthermore, they've argued that what this does is to help them be part of a larger multicultural world, the real world, that predominantly black schools could not have helped them experience. Uh, one of the writers I like, I mentioned Christopher Jenks, another is Orlando Patterson, no relation. He's a sociologist, an African-American sociologist at Harvard. Wrote a book called uh, The Ordeal of Integration a few years ago. He concluded uh, that it wasn't, uh, the good thing about desegregating school wasn't that you necessarily got smarter because you went to school with smarter black kids, because they were smart. <coughs> what was good about it was that, in fact, uh, in most cases it does promote greater understanding and toleration. And furthermore, that blacks receive what he calls informal education. That is to say, greater savvy, this is a quote, savvy about the ways and networks of the majority population. Well, for these reasons, I'm gonna rush through to the end here. I think that greater racial integration of the schools is a worthy goal tolerate further resegregation, which has been happening in public education, is to risk, risk the greater resegregation of society at large, and therefore to heighten the race of racial isolation and denial of equal opportunity in the country. As Christopher Jenks again put it, the more you let society pull itself apart into separate groups, the less commitment one group has to another, the less commitment the haves have to the have-nots. Final thought about strategies for the promotion of racial justice. The complicated history of Brown since 1954 suggests to me and to others that the key to advances in race relations, and there were real advances in the 60s, and some sense, has been the existence of powerful social and political pressures. That is to say, what you have to have to make really important social change is a movement, in this case, a grassroots, broad-based civil rights movement. As I mentioned earlier, 
The reliance on litigation, on law cases, which Marshall and his team of lawyers were trying to do. Marshall, in fact, was very uneasy when these kids started getting out on the streets and demonstrating, in part because he and the NAACP were asked to bail him out of jail. And that cost money. And that's, he just thought we should do this through the law. But even Marshall came to understand, I think, although very reluctantly, by the 60s, that litigation was necessary, but to repeat was not sufficient strategy for significant change. Lawyers need powerful political and social backing. This they didn't have in the 50s for the Brown case. From Eisenhower, from the Republican Party, from the Democratic Party, from uh, state chief justices, from uh, the Supreme Court after Brown won, which more or less kept quiet on the question of schools until the late 60s. Support from white Americans since the 50s, moreover, I'm sorry, since the 60s, 60s has been scattered and weak. And for these and other reasons, the decision has been, has left, as my subtitle suggests, a troubled legacy. I'm going to close with one four-line quote from Jack Greenberg, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. As I say, he was a top attorney with Marshall. Uh, he wrote a book on the problem in 1994. Still alive, last I heard. Greenberg wrote, altogether, school desegregation has been a story of conspicuous achievements, flawed by, mar flawed by marked failures, the causes of which lie beyond the capacity of lawyers to correct. Lawyers can do right, they can do good, but they have their limits. The rest of the job is up to society. Thank you. Q&A with Professor Patterson, and so I'll open it up. But before, I, I'm going to reserve the right to the first one. Um, in your book, it talks about some of the characters that you talked about. Thurgood Marshall, talked about uh, the President Eisenhower Johnson, but you also talked about Earl Warren and his ability to kind of put together a fractured court. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that ability and perhaps squeeze in and maybe uh, how our very reluctant, our Robert Jackson got uh, brought into the unanimity All right, All right. Uh, it's, a long, it's a long story which I will uh, take a minute or two to answer correctly. Warren doesn't become the Chief Justice, uh, not appointed as the Chief Justice until October of 1953. Excuse me, October 1953. Uh, he's act not actually confirmed, I think, until March of 54, but he's nonetheless uh, Chief Justice in fact. Before he took over, the court was a badly divided institution, and the story that everybody tells in my book, and if you've heard it, I'm going to tell it again anyway, so listen. Uh, <laughs> chief Justice Fred Vinson was the Chief Justice uh, prior to Warren. He was a poker-playing buddy of Harry Truman who appointed him to the court. Uh, he had a dis distinguished career as a congressman from Kentucky and as an administrator during World War II. He was one of the architects of the Social Security Act in 1935. But he was out of his, out of his element, uh, out of his depth uh, as a Chief Justice. He just was not able to earn the respect or even the personal friendship of most of the other judges. And the court was badly split on a whole range of issues. Not so much race as civil liberties issues surrounding the Cold War, where people were being prosecuted uh, even before the, Joe McCarthy came on the scene in early 1950. Anyway, Vincent suddenly dies, totally unexpectedly, in his hotel apartment in September of 1953. And uh, Felix Frankfurter, who was one of the judges, was said to have commented to one of his clerks, this is the first time I've ever believed there might be a god. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story. Uh, Warren comes in, and the answer to your question is, Warren was an amazingly uh, open, affable, non-pompous, um, 
uh, person. He uh, was then in his third four-year term as the immensely popular governor of California. He had run for the presidential nomination. A lot, in those days, you see, a lot of judges weren't, uh, Supreme Court judges weren't judges as they are now. They were politicians or other things. Robert Jackson, as you know, didn't even have a college education when he was appointed to the court by Roosevelt, which is quite remarkable considering his distinguished career. But um, so he runs against uh, Eisenhower for the nomination in 1952. It's a very tight race involving Eisenhower and Robert Taft of Ohio, uh, whose biography I've written. I, I say that not because you can buy the book. It's long been out of print. Yeah. But, um, it was a close race. The last time we actually had a national nominating convention, it meant anything. And at the very end, uh, Eisenhower won because he uh, got the support of Earl Warren. And so he realized once he became president that he owed Warren something. And he tried to give him a cabinet position. He didn't want a cabinet position. He said he wanted a Supreme Court justiceship. Mm -hmm. Eisenhower, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Maybe nobody's going to die, right? Um, because Warren was far, far more liberal than, than um, Eisenhower. Well, um, Vincent dies, and Warren says, uh, you said Judge Justice. You didn't say anything about Chief Justice. Okay, so he names him. Eisenhower, I don't think, really thought very much about um, what Warren might believe or uh, want to do about this case, which was pending, and everybody knew it was pending. Uh, I'm not sure what that says about Eisenhower's president. At any rate, the, Warren is on the court, and for the next several months, between October of 53 and when the decision was finally announced in 54, he worked very hard to soothe these animosities and to, to do something which he thought was very important. So important that um, uh, the court, in fact, when it issued Brown, did not indicate how it should be complied with. This was kind of an understood tacit deal. We'll get the unanimity, and we'll worry about the enforcement later. He gets unanimity. He even gets uh, on his side a guy by the name of Stanley Reed of uh, Kentucky, who was known as a segregationist. So the decision was unanimous. And most uh, scholars at the time thought this was a wonderful and very important achievement. Uh, I think when we realized that the, the case wasn't honored for 15 years in the South, maybe it wasn't such a wonderful achievement as people thought it was. But certainly it's better to have a nine to nothing decision than what this court's been having for the last 20 years, one five to four decision after another uh, in a democracy to think that major issues rest on the vote of one person is a bit unsettling. But Warren, Warren was a very, very important figure in all of this. Uh, and he, uh, I think he can be credited with, with, uh, with bringing this court together, with giving it a sense of itself, which made it a very important uh, liberal court for the next um, 15 years. Warren retired from the court in 1969. Um, and uh, so he was, an a long answer to your question, very important. Jackson, um, many of you probably know, the court, the case was first heard in December of 1952. That is to say, the first time Thurgood Marsh and the others came in and made the arguments. Vincent was still Chief Justice. They, they, the uh, judges clearly couldn't make up their mind. They also wanted more historical evidence. What did the framers of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution ratified in 1868 have in mind concerning segregation of schools? The 14th Amendment says, of course, that no state may deprive a person of life, liberty, or property. And it says that uh, the states must guarantee equal protection under the laws, these famous phrases. It was the 14th Amendment that the Warren Court used to strike down segregation because it said that state-mandated segregation uh, was, in fact, a denial of uh, equal protection of the laws. Now, Jackson, uh, in, in, De in 19 December 52, it was often felt that there were four judges who were clearly going to vote to overturn the Plessy decision and to overturn segregation. There were Three, including Vincent, who were thought to be opposed to overturning Plessy and opposed to overturning segregation. There were two, Felix Frankfurter and Robert Jackson, who were on the fence. Uh, Jackson, like Frankfurter, was an ardent foe, well, certainly a foe of, of uh, segregation. He was in no sense a racist in that sense of the term. Mm -hmm. 
But he, like Frankfurter, and like a lot of judges, and a lot of lawyers, had doubts about whether it should be the job of a non-elected body, such as the Supreme Court or any federal court, or any state court for that matter, uh, to make bold ventures into social policy, such as desegregation. He thought this should be done, Frankfurter thought this should be done, by democratically elected state legislatures. <clears throat> that is to say, through the voice of the people. Of course, they weren't about to do that. Uh, and so in the end, in the end um, both Frankfurter and um, Jackson uh, lend their names to the majority of four that existed in December of 52. Warren made five, so they've already got a majority. And it was the job of Warren to get the other four, and he gets Jackson and Frankfurter, he gets uh, Reed, and he gets Tom Clark. Several of these people, I mean, uh, Reed, was, Reed was from Kentucky, Hugo Black was from Alabama, Clark was from, from Texas. There was a strong Southern representation on that court. I should point out, by the way, every single one of those judges had been appointed either by Franklin Roosevelt or by Harry Truman. They were not Republican appointees. And the fact that you could have a very divided court on that issue suggests how strong uh, segregation was in the United States and in the law in the early 50s.